Welcome to Stories of Impact. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and along with journalist Richard Sergey, every first and third Tuesday of the month, we share conversations about the art and science of human flourishing. I'm tempted to say that today's episode is a very personal one, but that might be a bit misleading, as every Stories of Impact episode is deeply personal. But today's conversation is all about young people, education, mental health, and thriving. And these are all things that my family and I take very personally. My parents were both teachers, and I grew up with their stories about the thrills and the challenges of guiding and learning from young people in classroom settings. And my father is currently in the last few weeks of his run for Idaho State Superintendent of Public Instruction, the highest office in my home state that oversees public education. As his deputy campaign manager, I'm considering with him what it is that students need to thrive. Is it more teachers and smaller class sizes? Is it better school infrastructure and more technology? Is it more on-site nutrition and healthcare resources? Again and again, what we keep coming back to are a couple key points. Student mental health is an increasing concern of teachers, administrators, and political leaders. In addition, thriving, mentally healthy students measurably benefit from what we on the Stories of Impact podcast have called virtues, including gratitude, the ability and willingness of citizens to use their voice, and a sense of purpose and connection in community. As this week's episode will show, the role these virtues play in mental well-being is not restricted by geography or cultural boundaries. Rather, these virtues are part of a formula for student success that may, in fact, be universal. Allow me to introduce you to the Shamiri Institute, a world away from the state where I was born and raised, Idaho. Today's story takes us to Kibera, in the urban slums of Nairobi, Kenya, where an innovative, interdisciplinary, youth-led caregiving model is increasing student levels of success and student mental health. We have this very unique circumstance, which is that we have a very youthful population. Meet Tom Osborne, community mobilizer, entrepreneur, and research scientist, and Harvard psychology graduate. In his long list of accolades and successes, he is most recently co-founder and executive director of Shamiri, which means thrive in Kiswahili. Here's Tom explaining the genesis of the Shamiri Institute. The median age across Sub-Saharan Africa is 19. So more than half of the population in these countries are 19 and below. And this is really different demographic-wise from the rest of the world. Our education system was not equipped to handle so many young people at the same time. So just like in my time going through high school, the average size of the classes had more than doubled. The college opportunities were still the same. Jobs were still the same. So when young people in the Kenyan context look at what is happening, they find it very hard to be able to draw or paint a clear path towards self-fulfillment. Tom answered this need by co-founding Shamiri, a cutting-edge educational organization that put youth mental health, meaning, and purpose at its center. He wanted to equip his fellow young Kenyans not just with a way to improve test scores and offer better access to systems of knowledge they would need to succeed, but even more importantly, he wanted to give Kenyan students a sense of self, confidence, agency, and resilience. He wanted to explore what simple interventions could help young people as they transitioned from adolescence into adulthood, what could give them the best chance and opportunity to actualize life outcomes and realize their dreams. We define human flourishing from a functioning perspective. So are you able to function socially? Can you maintain relationships with your family, friends, significant others, etc.? From an academic perspective, a classwork perspective, are you able to function from that 
perspective. Our work is not about labeling you as being depressed or anxious and dealing with that. But our work is how to help you become a better human, you know, how to help you improve your social connectedness, your optimism, happiness, sense of purpose. At its core, it's about, you know, human flourishing and trying to give you the tools to navigate life from that approach. Tom and his colleagues realized that to help young Kenyans flourish, they had to directly address young people's unmet mental health care needs from within a culture that didn't even yet communicate in the language of mental health. Mental health is stigmatized in Kenya and in many communities around the world. In our work in Kenya, we have realized that part of the stigma comes from people not being one familiar with mental health. Most Kenyan communities don't have equivalents for most of his mental health problems. So for example, in my tribal mother tongue, there is no direct word for depression. So if you are going to diagnose someone with depression, you're diagnosing them with something that they don't really know about and can't really comprehend. So we think that is the first part of the problem with stigma. And the second part of the problem just comes from the history of mental health in Kenya. When someone is diagnosed with a mental health problem, they're removed from the community and then they're taken to an asylum and then they're locked there for a while. So that obviously really influenced how people think about mental health problems. So how do we counteract stigma in Kenya? We don't focus on arriving at a diagnosis of depression or calling someone depressed, but we focus on other constituent underlying symptoms of depression. So for example, things like, you know, trouble sleeping, lack of motivation, feeling sad. Our project intentionally focuses on human flourishing, intentionally focuses on a holistic definition of mental health that not only includes psychopathology or, you know, having depression and anxiety, but also includes, you know, more generally human functioning and character strengths and, you know, positive things like optimism and happiness and social, you know, connectedness. One of the key things that we really try to help develop is self-efficacy and just giving the young people that we're working with the idea that they have agency and autonomy in their life. So in other words, the idea that they can make decisions and that their decisions are important. That really improves their own you know, self-efficacy and really motivates them to start taking action on these other things that we teach them, like you know, practicing gratitude, growth mindset, etc. How exactly is Shamiri designed to work? Our character, our personality, traits, etc., really determine a lot about how we go about and how we really experience the world. It determines how we respond to adversity, when we face adversity or when we fail, how we react to success, you know, when we are successful. And often, especially in a low resource context like Kenya where we work, when we think about change, when we think about changing life outcomes, we tend to think about it from a very infrastructure perspective. So we tend to think about it from the perspective of like, we need to build more schools, we need to, you know, more teachers, we need to reform the whole curriculum, et cetera. But what we are realizing over the past few years is that actually, if we focus on the characters and the personalities and the traits that they have, and we try to really strengthen that, we can, without completely changing the system or, you know, building new schools, give people a platform to become better. For example, we work with a school in Kibera, which is a very large urban slum here in Kenya. And what we have realized from our work there is once the students participated in our programming, 70% of the students saw a 2% increase in their grades which is, you know, a big increase just from participating in a program that is focused on character development and focused on character strengths. And these kind of outcomes are often similar or sometimes even exceed, you know, the changes in outcomes that we see when we build new infrastructure, or hire more teachers, etc. 
So the true benefit of character strength and character development, especially in the context of young people, adolescents who are still young and very malleable and where there's still a great opportunity to intervene, is that we can, at a very low cost, through very scalable models and methods, be able to allow people to improve in outcomes like their grades, social relationships, school climate, etc., without the top-down, high-resource changes that we normally do. And so eventually, if then we have this great recipe to be able to turbocharge change and to empower young people to realize their dreams. Young people gather in groups of eight to 15 students, and this is implemented as an after-school program. Between 10 to 15 percent of the students will need more support. And so for those students, we normally offer them a one-on-one -on -one engagement outside of the group context. We will give them exercises. So one of those exercises may include keeping a gratitude journal where every day they write and reflect on the things that they're grateful for that happened to them. Or it might include asking them to write a gratitude letter to a friend or a teacher or just anyone who they want to express their gratitude for. And so those activities will be individual. And so that is generally how we do it. So a mix of reading, writing, group discussion activities. Are you interested in learning more about how to effectively address mental health in challenging contexts? Building on rigorous scientific research, the field of human flourishing offers promising insight into how individuals and communities can tap into inner resources to improve lives, communities, and countries. Join us November 29th and 30th for the first annual Global Scientific Conference on Human Flourishing and participate in the dynamic conversation. To attend this can't-miss opportunity, register at humanflourishing.org. Again, that's humanflourishing.org. What Tom Osborne and his colleagues have found in their work with Shamiri students is that as students' mental health is addressed, their overall ability to flourish increases, which naturally increases their chance for success in school as they navigate through adolescence and as they move into adulthood. They designed Shamiri not only to address mental health, but around a unique multi-stage feedback loop, which offers an opportunity for participants to train each other and increase each other's skill set. The work that we do at Shamiri, the first component is that we develop what we call character strength interventions. These are interventions which are evidence-based and focused on you know, improving holistic mental health and well-being, reducing depression and anxiety symptoms, but improving social relationships, optimism, happiness, academic functioning, etc. That's the first part of our work, building this toolkit of data-driven interventions. The second part of our work is building the framework or the infrastructure to deliver these interventions. We have developed what we call a three-tier caregiving model. So the first level of this tier are individuals who we call tri fellows. So these are 18 to 22 year old recent high school graduates who we train on these interventions that we develop. And then they go back to their communities and they go back to their schools to be able to deliver these interventions. The best way to work within communities is to work within schools because a huge part of the population in Kenya is in secondary schools. The second part of our tier in the Western context will be the equivalent of clinical social workers. So they're folks who have, you know, some background in, in social work or counseling or psychology, etc. And their work is to identify, recruit, train and supervise the fellows, as well as to handle, you know, one-on-one -on -one care if people need one-on-one -on -one care. And finally, we integrate with existing clinical experts. So the psychiatrists and the clinical psychologists a key to Shamiri's success is that its curriculum and trainings come from a well-qualified, diverse global team. I think a huge, if not the main factor for the success we've had as an organization and the ability that we've had to work with so many young people and see these improvements in their mental health, wellness, academics, etc 
is because we work with um, a multidisciplinary and a multicultural team of researchers, educators, mental health experts from around the world. For a long time, when we have been thinking about mental health and well-being, we've tended to do that in silos, you know, so the psychiatrists work on their own, the psychologists work on their own, educationists work on their own, etc. And we think that there is a lot of value and benefit in moving away from the silos and working, you know, more multidisciplinary. And so our team has mental health researchers with 20, 30 years of experience in the US, in Kenya, in Europe, etc. We work with educators, you know, grassroots entrepreneurs, etc. And what this has allowed us to do is to combine the latest evidence-based intervention science with the realities of, for example, logistics of implementing something on the ground, which, you know, someone walks in the grassroots will know. Again, the courageous manner in which the Institute moves the conversation beyond cultural stigma to constructively address pressing mental health care needs is one of the keys to Shamiri's success. We will diagnose someone with depression or anxiety and think of that as coming from a deficit. And then we'll try to treat that and help them get better. Over the last you know, 10, 15 years, there's been advancement in research. Rather than only thinking about this from a deficit perspective, we can think about it from a strength perspective. So from the perspective of like strengthening the attributes, personalities, traits, and characters that we already have, and trying to use that to help us function better, have better relationships, and do better in life. We try to teach young people a growth mindset. So rather than thinking about their personal traits and attributes as being fixed, we try to train young people to think about these attributes as being malleable and things that they can change through effort. As they go through our programming, we train them to see challenges as opportunities for growth. Another part of our intervention is practicing gratitude. It's a very universal, common trait. And what we know from the science is folks who are more grateful tend to exhibit better states. So they tend to you know, be happier, to be healthier, to have better relationships, etc. And especially in low resource contexts, like the context where we are working in, we've realized that working with young people to enable them learn and practice gratitude can be very important. Often we're working with young people in such circumstances that they don't see or they don't think that there is anything that they can be grateful for. But what we try to tell them, what we try to train them is to notice even small things in their life that they can be grateful for. And what we realize is that helps make them feel like they belong, make them feel like the people who care about them, and make them you know, see that things are not as difficult as they may imagine. Whenever we have to make decisions in difficult circumstances, we are often guided by our values. It's the things that we care about that help us you know, navigate really difficult circumstances in life. And so by training young people to whenever they are facing difficult circumstances, reflect on their values and take values aligned decisions, we think that that also expands the toolkits of resources that they have as they're navigating from you know, high school into adulthood. So these are very simple, you know, humanistic tools or interventions, as we call them formally in the scientific literature. And they are interventions that focus on what it means to be human. They're very positively focused. They don't need us to define or label someone as, you know, being depressed or anxious. And you actually don't even need to be depressed or anxious to go through these interventions. And so when young people sign up for our programming, we take them through four weeks of this in group context. And all the time, Shamiri is collecting data about their interventions so that they can measure their impact and improve and expand their services. Data is very important to the work that we do. And we have, as a society, a lot of examples where we have scaled up and invested a lot of resources in things that don't work but feel good. Colloquially, we call this vibes. So, you know, we have a lot of examples of where programs where the vibe felt good and was for a good cause was scaled up, uh, etc. And over 40, 50 years, especially in Africa, 
We have all of these international development efforts mostly which have not resulted to a lot of like tangible change because they were not data driven. But for us at its core, a commitment to data is a commitment to humility. By collecting data, it allows us to be humble and to accept that you know there's a high chance you're going to fail. We can document our failure, we can learn from it, and when we realize and we find something that works, then we have some foundation to at least have a compelling case to scale it up. So that is, at least for us as an organization, the core of why a data-driven focus makes sense. Open science is very important, especially for character strength interventions. We think they have a lot of opportunities and a lot of potential to be used around the world. We think the work they're doing in Kenya can be a template you know, for Uganda, South Africa, etc. And a commitment to open science, having our protocols accessible, our data accessible, you know, creates this environment where we can do something that people are doing in South Africa, you know, um, and stay true to how they're doing it, or if we make decisions to do it differently, open science allows us to be able to build templates that can be scaled in different contexts. We believe our program is scalable in other contexts. Actually, this year, we are doing a pilot with a group in Lithuania. So in Lithuania, they have, I think, one of the highest young adults and teenage suicide rates in the world. I mean, we're working with a group there. We have had a similar trial as well in Morocco and Uganda. Our work is very simple. What we have is almost like a template that, you know, yes, needs to be adapted and fine-tuned to different geographies, but we think that it is a template that can be used in other contexts around the world. Since 2018, Shamiri has worked with 11,500 students, and their current reach is 4,000. What is the key to reaching so many students? You know, one of the great challenges that we've had, when people come together in a group context to, you know, be part of a program in a group context, we think there's a lot of value in that. And there's also a lot of studies that show that this kind of in-person, group-based, community-centered programming work better than, for example, digital interventions. And so that's one of the reasons why we focus a lot on in-person group work. But then that obviously brings a huge challenge of how can you make sure that you're able to run group sessions for 5,000 or 10,000 students concurrently. As we're thinking about scaling and amplifying our impact, how do we stay true to what we've tried and tested in these you know, smaller cohorts and just maintain that integrity and fidelity as we reach and work with many people. We want to reach a million people by 2027, but the measure of success is a guiding post and not an end in and of itself. So the goal that we have is not to reach a million people and call it success and be done. We want to reach a million people while still trying to, as much as we can, stay true to this being, one, a data-driven organization that really puts data at the front of what we're doing. And even if it means that, you know, at half a million people, we realize that what we're doing is not working, we will be open to, you know, changing and doing things differently rather than just trying to reach the million because it's the goal. And second, maintaining our grassroots commitment. So maintaining our commitment to working with local communities, to working in community-based contexts like schools, to the extent that we can, embedding those with lived experience and those who are closest to the problem as part of our caregiving model, as our fellows, as our supervisors, as part of our team. A huge part of the work that we have done and are going to continue to do is going to build this infrastructure for running group-based programming within schools. So that's one part of the work that we're doing. So just, you know, being able to identify how to train and recruit providers, how to take them to schools, etc. Should we be giving the same intervention to everyone? Do some interventions work better for like, you know, middle-income girls than low-income boys, etc.? cetera? Um, so at this very different granular demographic level, should we prioritize different approaches um, or have a one-fit-all approach? We have all of this ongoing research that's going to help us move from that one-fit-all approach to a more 
contextualized approach. When humans flourish, it means we are on a journey toward a life that is holistically good, encompassing mental well-being, living with purpose, and building character. Studies globally are revolutionizing our understanding of human flourishing, and leading scientists and practitioners like Tom Osborne are applying this research to develop practical tools to help people flourish. Both the science and the innovative applications will be on display at the first annual Global Scientific Conference on Human Flourishing, November 29th and 30th. To attend this can't-miss opportunity, register at humanflourishing.org. Again, that's humanflourishing.org. And what do teachers and students report about the impact of Shamiri's work? Here's Bernard, a Shamiri teacher. We came for a training, a one-week training. Then we were taught on how to teach the students, and we began the program. We were taught about uh, using other methods, apart from the methods that are teacher-centered, like you can pick a text, compose a song, do acting or uh, do spoken word, anything that can uh, motivate the students so that they can understand well. So when we are acting or when we are composing a song, we involve each and every student. The site of our school is in uh, Kibra slums. Most of the students we teach, they're coming from poor backgrounds. So we are trying to maintain them in school. Immediately after the pandemic, we've got students that are young mothers. We've got those that engaged in drugs because of the long period they were at home. So we found the programs at Shamiri effective because one, they will offer what we call psychosocial support. Sometimes these kids who are coming from families where the breadwinner, maybe the father who used to pay school fees after the corona pandemic, they lost jobs. So they're going through a lot. Even uh, some families broke up as a result of the pandemic. So the major problem you're having is drug and substance abuse. The problems at home and the long duration they were at home, then that peer pressure lured them to start using these drugs. So Shamiri is, uh, they're trying to offer psychosocial support, whereby they're trying to offer counseling to these kids so that they can stop the drugs. It has really impacted on their culture, the way they even articulate themselves, the way they move around, the way they interact with other people, the way they also interact amongst themselves. It has really improved. And Layla, a Shamiri student. To me, I had a low self-esteem. I could not even stand in front of people. I didn't have that courage. And when they came to school, because I like socializing with people, I went and interrupt with the facilitators who are teaching us and knew more about the program. And from there, I knew that eh, if I continue with this program, it will improve my self-esteem and I'll be courageous and I'll learn more so that even me too, I can go and help other people in the society with the information. A lot of my friends are participating in the program and to add on top of that, I've seen some of them have started gaining confidence to interact with other people inside the school and outside the school. Tom Osborne, Shamiri co-founder, is optimistic and inspired by the progress of the Institute so far and for the opportunities that lie ahead as the work evolves and expands in response to data collection. He has reached thousands of fellow young Kenyans He's just getting started, and he's eager for more. Eager to increase the impact the work can have on his country and on the world. That we have such a young and youthful population in Kenya and similar countries is something I find really exciting. I think this is either going to be the opportunity of my generation or the challenge of my generation. How do we ensure that this really youthful population are able to meaningfully live and engage with the society. And I think that it is this young generation which is going to you know, take that final leap and step into helping Kenya and similar countries actualize their potential. What excites me most is that the work that we are doing at Shamiri 
gives us this opportunity to be quite impactful in the lives of so many young people who are going to play such a vital and important role within this country as they just progress through their life. For as long as they're going to be alive, it is this young generation which is going to be the largest demographic and the largest constituent in Kenya and similar countries. I think there's just so much potential there. And that we at Shamiri can, in one way or the other, help actualize or realize that potential is something that really keeps me going and really motivates me and inspires me about the work that we're doing at Shamiri. Tom Osborne might have remained in the United States after he earned his degree from Harvard, but he returned home to Kenya to offer the benefit of his education and experience to his fellow Kenyans. I've had a similar experience in working in Idaho, helping my father's political campaign. It's been a homecoming of sorts, as I've been back in touch with the communities of my youth, the towns, the counties, the newspapers that filled in the background of my childhood and adolescence. There's something uniquely powerful about doing work where you came from, bringing back what you learned from away to try to give even more to people at home. I can't wait to check back in with Tom Osborne to see when he hits the million mark. And in the meantime, I think he sets an inspiring example for us all about how to turn challenges into opportunities and how to be of service in the world and at home. I'm really glad that you follow our podcast and that you're a part of the Stories of Impact community. If you loved this episode and if you love what you learn every other week, I'd really appreciate it if you'd help us grow our audience. As I've mentioned in past episodes, it's a scientific fact that most often, podcasts are discovered through referral, when fans who love the show tell others all about it. So please don't wait to share the Stories of Impact podcast with other curious souls like yourself so that we can reach new listeners. And it really makes a big impact for us if you take a moment to give us a five-star rating and leave a short review. You can always retweet us or share our Instagram or Facebook posts. And if you want to go back and listen to past episodes, you can find all of our conversations on your favorite podcast player or at storiesofimpact.org. This has been the Stories of Impact podcast with Richard Sergey and Tavia Gilbert, written and produced by TalkBox Productions and Tavia Gilbert with senior producer Katie Flood. Music by Alexander Filipiak. Mix and master by Kayla Elrod. Executive producer, Michelle Cobb. The Stories of Impact podcast is generously supported by Templeton World Charity Foundation.